Hello everyone, this is Tom Moore, better known to most of you as Purple Pain from VikeFans.com. Today I'd like to welcome someone who we all instantly recognize, but has never actually been on the Minnesota Vikings roster. Yet, he's considered to be equally important to helping the Vikings win football games in the Metrodome, and has taken his permanent spot in the Viking end zone for each contest. Call him a Viking fanatic, ESPN selected number one Vikings fan, or even 100% cheese free. No matter how you refer to him, please help me welcome Sid Davey to VikeFans.com. Sid, how are you doing today after the Vikings' disappointing 34-24 opening day loss to the Lions? Well, I'm doing uh, very good, actually. Uh, it was a very disappointing game. It really hurt uh, having... Uh, Kevin Williams and Shree Floyd in there. It uh, really showed by Reggie Bush's performance up the middle, and uh, I do not think that would have happened if those two were in the game. Well, Sid, I know you've been a fixture in the Viking end zone since 1986, but you've been a Viking fan for much longer than that, and I understand that Jim Marshall was strangely a part of your first memories of the Minnesota Vikings. Can you tell us about your first game you recall watching? Oh, I, I recall that, that game very well against the San Francisco 49ers. And uh, Jim Marshall kicked in the fumble and uh, ran it the wrong way and spiked the ball in the end zone. And he was running the wrong way. I was just screaming at the TV. And there, you're going the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. But the good part about it was we still won the game. You know, that kind of led to a little bit more exposure to the Purple Squad, but you really didn't become a diehard fan until 1967. What was the event that locked you in as a Viking fan that year? Well, the main event was Bud Grant. Like, I was a Viking fan before 67, but when Bud Grant came in 67, that is what really cemented me in as a lifelong Viking fan. Bud Grant used to coach my team, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And he won four Great Cup championships. And uh, before he was coach with the Big Blue Bombers, he was also a player. He played offense and defense. And he still holds the record of five interceptions in a Great Cup game, which uh, I doubt will ever be broken. From that time forward, you became a fan extraordinaire and took it to the next level when, in 1986, you started your truck to where you drove from your home in Winnipeg to the Metrodome every single week for the home games. How many miles have you logged, and is the trip home tough after a loss? Well, the miles I've logged, let's see, I've, I've driven to almost every single game. I've missed seven games since 1986, and it's pretty close to 300,000 miles. Uh, each trip is a little over a 1,000-mile round trip for me, so it's uh, at least a distance to the moon. Yeah, that's quite a way, certainly, to go see your Vikings play, but when you do get that experience to where they happen to lose in the Metrodome, what's that ride like for you? Well, it's a very quiet ride on the way home when we lose. It's a very happy ride when we win, but the drive home is uh, very quiet. And my wife hates the drive home when we lose because uh, I'm just not very talkative. Your passion from attending the games in 86 really started to evolve in 1993 when you kind of changed what your appearance looked like and how people saw you on TV. Tell us about what that was and that event that caused you to really become what today is 100% cheese free. It actually started uh, October 31st. We played against the Detroit Lions, and I decided to uh, dress up as a Viking that game, and I had a Viking helmet, and I I put on the purple, and I painted my face purple, and I put on the uh, yellow mustache and yellow eyebrows with my Viking helmet. And since 1987, I've always worn 100% cheese free on my back. And that's got a little bit of a story behind it, too. There was a guy named Bruno, and he lived in Wisconsin, and his mother was reupholstering a uh, couch. And when she was doing that, he cut a, a triangle out of a piece of foam in the couch and painted it orange and put it on his head, and that was the start of the cheese hat. I hated that just so much. My grandmother was a Packer fan. We always had the big rivalry watching the games every weekend. But when I started seeing all these cheese hats come out, and uh, in 1987, I figured I'd... Uh, come up with something of my own to get back at the Packers. So I uh, started wearing 100% cheese-free on my back. And I got that idea from in my teens working out in the gym. I was always a gym rat and the only steroid guys in the gym. And uh, I was, I've was i always been natural all my life. And uh, I used to wear a T-shirt in the gym uh, 
100% steroid free. Just to bug all the uh, all the drug users in there. And, and then uh, when, when I saw these cheese hats, uh, the thought in my head just went uh, 100% cheese free <laughs> to get those cheese hats off their heads. Never got the hats off their heads, but I, I made my point to them anyway. When you look at getting prepared for games, how long does it take you to get ready and don your entire 100% cheese free Viking uniform? And do you have any pregame rituals yourself? It takes you 40 minutes to get completely dressed and uh, my face paint done. But uh, pre-game rituals, outside of beer leaves and coffee, uh, <laughs> wake up in the morning, and uh, that's, that's usually how I start my pre-game with beer leaves and coffee. Well, I know you give generously of your time with the fans before the game. Can you talk to us about the magic of Minnesota Viking tailgate parties, and how do you think the experience will change when the new stadium allows for more tailgate activities to occur? Well, my tailgating, I've got um, my private tailgate party that I, I actually have sponsors uh, that uh, take care of everything for me. They have a warehouse for me on the corner of Washington, and right next to Bob and Steve's service station. They pay for the warehouse, they lease that for me every year. Then I've got five cooks that do all the cooking. One of my sponsors is uh, Twin City Hyde, so they supply all the meat. And Heineken Joe, he supplies the Heineken beer. And it's a, it's a phenomenal party. We've got uh, theater seating inside. A lot of people, they don't even uh, come into the game. They just sit in there and they watch the game on the big screen TV that we have in there. In 2008, we won uh, the ultimate tailgaters of the entire NFL uh, by ultimate tailgate. Dot com parking lot pro and American Tailgaters Association, which is pretty good. It's first, uh, probably the only national tailgating championship ever won in Minnesota. And it was an awesome event, and uh, it was just such a great group of guys. And my other tailgating, I have a, a lot on Washington and Chicago. We have a motorhome up there. It's called the Moss Pit. It's painted purple and uh, white and gold, and uh, it's got Moss Pit on the on the side of it. And then we got Corey Stringer's number on there. And then uh, we got most of my Knights of the Viking World Order. We have uh, about eight spots in Purple Lot One that we uh, tailgate at also. So you know, it's, it's it's tough getting to all of them, but I do get to every single one of them every single game. Well, Sid, what made you initially decide to select the end zone to watch the games, and have you ever seen a Viking game in another location in the stadium? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, I, I didn't get my federal end zone season until the 91 season, mm -hmm. and I started in the upper decks, and I watched the games in the upper decks. They, they had a, a drive-on for season tickets, and I was promised lower-level seats. Then all of a sudden, I started getting trouble getting a hold of them. You know, five months went by, I hadn't heard from them, so I called up the uh, Viking office and I asked about, about my tickets. And uh, and the guy says, oh, no, uh, we can't guarantee you lower-level seating. I said, well, that's what I paid for. So then I kept on calling back, and uh, they, they said, well, if there are lower-level seats, we'll try to get you lower-level seats. So then uh, about a month before the season started, uh, now I'm phoning, and, and this guy won't even return my call. Every time I call, uh, the secretary says, oh, well, well, he's not around, he's not around, but uh, I'll get him to call you back, and or he's on the telephone, and I'll get him to call you back, and he never did. So finally, I just got pissed off about it, and I phoned uh, the Vikings office and said, I'd like to speak to the president of the Minnesota Vikings. Mm -hmm. And they told me, uh, the president isn't in right now, but the vice president, Mr. Jeff Diamond, is in. So uh, they let me speak to Mr. Uh, Diamond, and I talking to Mr. Diamond. I told him how I was getting the run around over and over, and how I was promised these lower level seats, and uh, I haven't gotten them. And I finally said, you know, uh, my wife's going to be writing uh, the Minnesota Department of Tourism about this, and I I don't think you're going to like the letter. And they said, hold on, it's right there. He says, uh, if if I have to put you in the Viking's private box, they'll put you in the Viking's private box, but I'm guaranteeing you, you're going to get your lower level seats. Nice. And so, one week before the season started, I get a call from Mr. Jeff Diamond, and he says, Sid, I've got your lower level seats, but uh, I don't think we can get you the tickets in time for the first game, so I'd like you to come pick them up for me personally. So I come down to the stadium, and they come to the ticket office, and I'm, I'm here, and uh, uh, Mr. Diamond comes out and he has me this big wad of tickets. 
and look at it, Section 101, Rule 1, Seat 13 and 14, these are front row seats. Are these mine for just a season or what? He says, those seats are yours for as long as you want them. And that's how I got my front row seats. Joseph Evolve said you become much more than one individual supporting the team, and now you're a full squad, as you referred to earlier, as the Viking World Order. Can you tell us more about this group? I started the Victor World Order in 1997, but I just started as myself. In 1996, Hulk Hogan came out with the New World Order, where he spray-painted this world championship belt, NWO. And I saw that, and the light went out of my head. I just started the Viking World Order, and I, I got the same belt, the same gold championship wrestling belt, and uh, I painted it BWO which was the start of the Viking World Order. And uh, I wore that belt every single game. And in, in uh, 2006, the Vikings started their stadium drive to try to get the new stadium done. And uh, they came up to me and they asked me, uh, said, would you become an honorary member of Minnesota Momentum, the official Viking stadium drive group? And uh, I said, sure. And then I thought, you know, like, what can I do? Uh, you know, like, I live in Canada, so how much input can I put into this outside of been using my image for stuff. And I thought, you know, maybe I should try to put together a super super fan group. I started looking for super fans in the end of group for the Vikings. And the first guy I came across was named Dave Garza. Uh, he goes by the name of Diggs. I talked to him about this and uh, I told him, you know, I, I think I can put together a super group here that I uh, can work on the stadium. And uh, he said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. So I united him in and uh, we started making stipulations to become a member of the Viking World Order. And one of the stipulations is you have to be a diehard fan that bleeds purple. And so we decided all the members of the Viking World Order, before they're knighted in, will have to get a Viking World Order tattoo to show their dedication to the team. second member uh, was uh, Todd Glocky. Uh, he's known as Sir Bike Bike. Uh, Ragnar rides his motorcycle onto the field every single game. Then we just started getting more and more members. There, there isn't a fair weather fan amongst the Viking World Order. And uh, now we've got close to 200 members. And uh, we went out. I had members sending out uh, emails and uh, letters to uh, all the state representatives, uh, everybody, the state capitol, the mayor's office. It got so big, we started uh, putting on rallies all over the city. We'd have Bob Lertzema come out there with us. And uh, Bob is just the most wonderful guy. He, he, he's uh, a friendly giant. You know, Larry Spooner, uh, he was another one of my knights. Uh, he, he was even on the stadium drive back in the Red McComb era. He, even the last two weeks before uh, the end of this vote for it, we, we, we camped out at the state capitol, and it was just absolutely incredible. You know, and, and then the votes came through, and we, we, uh, we got the vote done in, at the uh, state capitol, and then the final vote came through uh, with the city council, which was 7-6. to six, And so we, we, we just won this by the skin of our teeth. The commissioner, Roger Goodell, he came out and uh, he came out to my tailgate and he thanked me personally, he shook my hand, thanked me for the work that uh, the Viking World Order did on the stadium drive. Carl Eller was with them and uh, Matt Blair was with them and it was just uh, absolutely an incredible day. Well, I can tell you one thing for sure. I, I know it, it made a huge difference, and so all Viking fans who wanted to see the team remain in Minnesota for their lifetime owe you a bit of debt of gratitude. But I talked to Lester Bagley last week, and you know, while he thanked the politicians for their work, and certainly Julie Rosen and others, uh, the first thing he said was it was really a, a joint effort, and it was started by Viking fans, and, and he knows that the Viking World Order was part of that. So it's not only a recognition for your group from the fans, but clearly the, the folks that are in the know at the Minnesota Vikings organization recognize you too, so we thank you. But Sid, the Viking World Order does so much more for the community than just the stadium drive effort. Can you tell us a little bit about the VWO's various charitable efforts in the Twin Cities? We do so much work with charities now with the Viking World Order, uh, with uh, CareBridge. We've got uh, one of our girls in the, in, in the Viking World Order. She's actually a leukemia survivor now. She, she was in chemotherapy for two years, and she, she's finally been given a clean bill of health, and uh, I brought her into my Valkyrie divisions. Like, the Viking World Order has seven divisions, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Special Ops, and uh, Homeland Security, and uh, we have our division for the, for the women also, 
uh, which is called the Volkri Division. And uh, she was actually my, my very first Volkri that I brought into the Volkri Division to start off the women's division. And uh, she, 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 she used to get her chemo therapy. And when they put the stint in her for her chemo, she'd pound her chest and go, defense, defense, defense. And uh, she just loves the Vikings so much. It's just absolutely incredible. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I just love working with people like this. We work with the Special Olympics. You know, we work, we, we do the, the breast cancer drive every year. And uh, this year uh, for the Special Olympics uh, at, the, at the Polar Punch, uh, the Breaking World Order itself raised $9,000. And uh, we had, uh, I think, uh, 20 members of the Breaking World Order that actually did the jump into the, into the icy water. Yeah, well, I, I can tell you one thing, and that's the beauty of the Vikings is, yes, it's a great experience on field. It's great before and after the games, but it's kind of the bond that, that strings us together that enables us to share our lives, and I think that's what's important, what you've done personally and also what your Viking World Order has done. And you've developed relationships over the years with many past Viking greats as well as uh, relationships with the current players on the rosters. But there was one special player who looked for you every time he scored, and Randy Moss thinks the world of you. And he said he always trusted you that you would protect him when he jumped into your arms after scoring a touchdown in the Metrodome. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience with Randy Moss, the player, and the person? Well, Randy Moss is such an unbelievable person. I do charity work with St. Jude's. And the reason why I started doing charity work with St. Jude's was because of Randy Moss. Randy Moss spent so much time at that hospital. He had pizza parties for the kids, and he'd bring the kids to the games. You just don't hear the good things he did. All you hear is the bad things about Randy Moss as far as the media goes, because he wouldn't get interviews, and the and the media just hated that, and they just went after him, and every little, every little molehill they turned into a mountain on him. And and the guy has heart. The guy absolutely has heart. He loved Minnesota. He still loves Minnesota. He's just such an incredible guy. I remember the first time that I caught him after a touchdown. It was uh, November fifteenth, uh, nineteen ninety eight. Uh, Randall Cunningham uh, threw a bomb to him. He caught a sixty one yard bomb, and just as he was crossing the goal line, he made eye contact with me, and I gave him a hand gesture to, to jump to me. And he came and he jumped to me. And I just ripped him into the stands because it was the first time I'd ever caught the player, so I didn't have my, my heels toned up for it yet. And uh, I ripped him into the stands, and then I put a bear hug on him. And uh, I held him in the stands for about two minutes. And Chris Carter finally came up to me and he says, Man, you got to give him back. you gotta, you got you to gotta put him down, man. Eh? And so I went and I lowered Randy back down to the field. And then the next day, on the, on the front page of the Star Tribune, they have a picture of me catching Randy Moss. And, and under the picture, it said, a lucky fan thought he had a great souvenir to take home, but he didn't read the back of his ticket to see the disclaimer saying that if you catch a flying player, you have to return him to the field. <laughs> <laughs> and I had such a good laugh out of that. But, uh, you know, and after that, Randy just kept on jumping to me. And uh, you know, every single time I caught Randy Moss, we won. So he started thinking of me as, as, as like a good luck charm because he'd always have, you know, a, a hundred plus yard game and, uh, the Vikings would always win and, uh, I would always lure him down the field. Not only would I catch him, pull him up that 10 foot wall, I'd lure him back down so he wouldn't hurt himself jumping back down to the field. If you try jumping up a 10 foot wall, that's not, a, that's not an easy feat to do. Right? I remember, uh, Adrian Peterson, uh, tried jumping up the wall and, uh, you know, all he could do is get to the top and, and hang on the wall. I actually met Adrian Peterson's dad in uh, at the Super Bowl in Arizona. I, I was doing some work with Sirius Satellite Radio. Right after my interview on Sirius, all of a sudden, uh, this big guy comes up to me. And, uh, he says, I want to thank you for all the nice things you're saying about my son. And it turned out to be Nelson Peterson. And he asked me, he said, do you mind if I have my picture taken? I said, sure, no problem. So you know, I told him, you know, how I used to catch Randy, and I used to pull him up to, and sit him onto uh, onto the top of the wall, and then I'd lower him back down to the field afterwards so he wouldn't get hurt. And I told him, you know, Adrian's tried jumping up that wall before. He's never actually gotten to sit on top of the wall. And I said, you know, if you tell Adrian to jump to me, I will catch him. I will pull him off the wall. I'll sit him on the wall, and I guarantee you there'll be some great pictures taken of him up there. And then I'll lower him down to the field so he doesn't get hurt. And so uh, in 2008, 
on the December game against uh, the Giants that we actually won uh, the NFC North Championship. He got a 67 uh, yard touchdown that game, and he came running right up to me, pulled him up the wall, I sat him on the wall, and uh, his pitcher ended up being a uh, pitcher for the uh, 2008 uh, NFC North Championship, which was pretty cool. I have to be honest with you, Sid. Not every celebration with Randy Moss was, while it was clearly 100% cheese free, they were not always pain free. And can you tell us about the time that Randy Moss almost put you on the injured reserve list after jumping uh, to you after a touchdown celebration? Oh, yeah, there was one game, caught him. I didn't get my face out of the way in time, and he caught me with his helmet right smack in the nose and flipped my nose open. <laughs> Just, I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's not an easy thing to catch a player that's going that fast coming at you. Like you, I, I wouldn't really recommend it to anybody if they don't know what they're doing because they could get a face full of helmet. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, but on a positive for everybody listening, uh, I do want to make sure everybody knows Sid did bleed, but he did finish out the game, so he did it in true Viking fashion. Uh, I blood purple. Well, over the years, uh, you've had the experience to meet a lot of players. Who were the most enjoyable and fan-friendly players that you've gotten to know? The most enjoyable player that uh, had most fan-friendly is definitely Bob Lertzema. You know, he may not have been the greatest Viking, but he's definitely the friendliest Viking. Uh, another great one is Chuck Foreman. The guy is just such an amazing guy. He goes to so many events. I've met pretty much every single Viking player. This year I was out golfing with uh, Randall McDaniel and uh, Joey Browner and uh, uh, Randy Moss. Uh, that's one of the things I've been really pushing for with the Vikings is trying to get Randy Moss putting the ring of honor this year because uh, Randy Moss is the guy that sold out the dome. Mm -hmm. He sold the dome out from the day he got there, and, uh, uh, you know, there there was blackouts before Randy Moss came to the Minnesota Vikings. uh, He he made such a difference to that team when he first came there. And right right after he was traded, the Vikings called me up, and uh, they they told me before he was traded, Mm -hmm. you know, and they said, Sid, Randy's going to be traded here. Uh, can we still count on you to be a Vikings fan? Said, Players come and go. No, but the fan is always there. I'm not going to not be a Vikings fan just because my favorite player was traded away. Okay. Uh, my, my heart is with that team. They're, they're my passion in life. No, this comes as a surprise to you, but you've known to try to get in the heads of opposing players in pregame warm-ups. What types of things do oh. you say to them, and has any member of another team responded to your comments? Oh, I've, I've had I've had players. I've even had coaches respond to me at games. I, I stay at the Marriott City Center. That's the the hotel I've stayed at the last twenty plus years, and most of the teams stay there. So I've gotten to meet all the players. I've, I've met John Madden there. I've I've met almost every single player in the NFL. I remember one time I was in there, and, uh, and I, all these Green Bay Packers are in the elevator with me, and like I, I wear these purple Doc Martin shoes, and you know I've always got purple and gold on, and. They started trying to start trying to make fun of my clothes that I'm wearing. I said, "What are you guys talking about? You guys got the ugly uniform the entire NFL. You're wearing cute green and piss yellow, and you're going to make a comment about purple." Then I started seeing skull elevate skull Vikings in the elevator with all these Packer fans. I tell you, by the time they got out of that elevator, they, they I, I don't think they ever wanted to see me again. It was just just incredible. But uh, at games, that I start on these players when they, they like my end zone is the is the end zone of the players practicing. You know, you get these these big offensive linemen in there, and I get on them at, at the game, and they they, they know who I am. And uh, I remember uh, Winters one year when he was with the Packers. I'm I'm bugging Winters, and you know. And tell him, hey, Winters, you fat slob. I said, you ate all the food in the Marriott. You left us nothing for the customers in there. You guys should be ashamed of yourself. I said, hey, hey, Winters, I heard you went to the Grand Canyon on your holidays last year. You fell in and got stuck. <laughs> but he starts laughing. All the other, all the other linemen are laughing as soon as I said that. And then Holmgren came up to me, and Holmgren starts flipping around. I thought he was going to try to come after me in the stands, you know, like uh, <laughs> he's telling the cops, I want this guy thrown out of here. I want him thrown out of here. And the cops are there. Uh, you think he throw it down, and then I started on the cops. I mean, hey, what are you, uh, Green Bay cops, or are you Minnesota cops? Who are you, who are you and then, uh, you know, like I, I've got all the fans behind me, you know, and uh, 
and they realize, hey, yeah, I don't think we can throw this guy out of here, so uh, maybe we better just take our players uh, out to the tender <laughs> so they can't hear him anymore. <laughs> but, you know, I have a great relationship with the Green Bay Packers. A lot of people don't don't realize that. Like my my grandmother was a an original Packer backer, bless her soul. She she died in in 1991, and uh, we used to watch the games together on the old black and white TV. You know, back in back in the early 60s, Hub Meds like uh, I remember when Hub Meds cut the, the mascot's head off for the Detroit Lions, and I just said, to my grandma, the Viking killed the lion. The Viking killed the... like it, it, it just amazed me so much, and like that's why Hub Meds was always my mentor, basically. On becoming what I became as, as, you know, the unofficial mascot of the Minnesota Vikings. At my tailgate party, one of my sponsors actually had uh, something to do with the Green Bay Packers Board of Directors. And now all of a sudden I've got all these Packers Board of Directors in, in, at my tailgate party and talking to my wife and she wears a purple wig and you know, she's a very beautiful woman. And so uh, they, they said to me, I said, why don't you uh, come out to a uh, Green Bay game? So I, they came out to a Green Bay game and they brought me up for the first half. They gave me two seats on the 50 yard line where I'm in with the fans just so I could get a taste of the stadium. Right. And then the second half, they had me come up to the border director's box. And I'm up to the border director's box and it's, it's plexiglass all the way through the stadium. Mm-hmm. And everybody could see me inside the border director's box. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, there's a lineup outside the door of the board of directors' box, and people want to have their pictures taken with me because they all know me from TV, and I'm I'm the guy they love to hate in Green Bay. I'm sort of like the antichrist in Green Bay. Uh, they actually hate me so much there that they like me, which is kind of <laughs> kind of weird. But all game long, there's people trying to get autographs and pictures taken with me when I'm in the board of directors' box, and. Uh, uh, by the end of the game, uh, Jim Christensen, he's one of the board of directors for the Green Bay Packers, has said, says, you know, anytime you ever want to come to a game in Green Bay, we'll have two seats reserved for you. And I've gone almost every year since then, and I've sat in the Green Bay Packers board of directors box, uh, eating their food and drinking their top shelf booze, and uh, it's, uh, it's just absolutely incredible. Well, from your perspective of all these years in the Metrodome, with it coming to a close this year uh, at the end of the 2013 season, what are your most treasured game memories in that stadium? I'll give you my top three memories. My, my, my top memory was my very first game I ever went to on September 28, 1986. And that was the first time I was ever in the Dome, and it just, it just uh, blew me away. I, I've never heard anything so loud in my life. Like, uh, I've, I've never been in a dome before. It was the first time I'd ever been in a dome, and the excitement in there was just incredible, and uh, the Vikings were playing the Packers, and it was just such a phenomenal game. We, we won the game 42-7, to and Tommy Kramer threw six touchdowns that game, and it was just electric. My next favorite memory was November 15th, the day that I caught Randy Moss. That was just incredible. The fans' reaction to it was just phenomenal. It was just like an avalanche on top of me with with fans trying to touch Randy and pat Randy. And uh, it was just, it's so hard to explain the feeling. It's embedded in my brain. I I can still see Randy first making eye contact with me before he made the jump and I yanked it into the stands. And the third would be uh, the day that I caught Adrian Peterson. I got to build the Jehovah Horn before the start of the game. I was honored uh, as uh, as a Viking fan, as the first Viking fan that ever got to blow the Jehovah Horn. And then to top it off, I caught Adrian Peterson after a 67-yard touchdown. And oh, I'll never forget that day. That was just incredible recently obviously in the last couple of years we've got a new quarterback at the helm uh, in minnesota with christian ponder and he struggled a bit yesterday uh, against the lions which kind of leads me to the question of a person who's seen an awful lot of quarterbacks come through minnesota in your time there going to the games who's the best quarterback that you've seen at the helm for the vikings yeah the true the prettiest pass of all was warren moon i mean he was he was a great guy I remember the first time that I met Warren Moon in Minnesota. All he wanted to do was talk about his, his, his rivalry with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Every time that he won a Grey Cup, and he won five Grey Cups in, in the CFL before he came up here 
to uh, Houston and then to Minnesota. He had, uh, you know, the, the, the big games every year was against him, Dieter Brock, and uh, we had just such a great conversation about uh, his CFL time, and uh, it, it was really hard to believe how much the CFL meant to that guy. And now things change a lot after this year as we prepare to move into the new stadium. We get ready for two years at TCF Bank Stadium, a college stadium on the University of Minnesota campus. And when the mercury drops below 20 degrees, will we still see 100% cheese-free sleeveless in the stands? Well, uh, there's a pretty big chance of it. It depends, uh, you know, how cold it gets. The game, uh, when we played there against the Bears, I actually wasn't sleeveless that game. I had armor all on. I, you know, I, I hate covering my arms up at games, but, uh, you know, sometimes it just gets too cold that you can't stay out there for three hours or you, you end up with hypothermia. No, don't get me wrong, Sid. If it were me, I'd not only have the armor all on, I'd probably be in the park at two with a fire burning somewhere. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> Yeah, that, that was a, that was a great game too. You know, like you were honoring the fifty greatest Vikings of all time there, and uh, you know Bud Grant was out in the field, and uh, Chris Carter. Chris Carter came right up to me in the stands, and he shook my hand. He says, "Randy Moss is hiding here," and then, you know, I just, I just thought that was so nice of Chris to do that. It, it was it was just a fun time, and watching watching Bud Grant and he put on the guy's shoulders and carried off the field. That was. Yeah, I, I, that, that brought a tear to my eye. I want to remind you that the day that they honored the 50 greatest Vikings for the 50th anniversary, Bud Grant was sleeveless in that weather. I know that you're not simply a fan, but the Vikings themselves consider you part of their organization, so much so that they did, in fact, invite you uh, to the game in London here, coming up with the Steelers to take your rightful spot in the end zone for our quote-unquote home game there. How special will that trip be for you, and what Viking-sponsored activities will you be participating in? Well, I'll, I'll be participating in pretty much all Vikings uh, sponsored activities out there. They gave me uh, four front row end zone seats at Wembley Stadium, so I'm going out there with my vice president, Sir Diggs, of the Viking World Order, and uh, his lovely wife, Jenny, and my wife, Susie. And the four of us will be in the front row uh, hoping to catch uh, Adrian Peterson or Jennings or Simpson or whoever wants to make their jump up there. We'll be pulling up in that stand and sit them on the wall and celebrating that touchdown with them and uh, kicking the Steelers' butts because I hate the Pittsburgh Steelers. I'll tell you that much. The Pittsburgh Steelers and Dallas Cowboys, those are my two most hated teams. I just I, I despise those two teams. Well, have you done your homework on Wembley Stadium? How tall are those walls? Uh, actually, I have not done the homework, but if a player can get halfway up that wall, I'll get them up the rest of the way, and no matter how, how high it is. I, I can guarantee you that. Well, Sid, we appreciate you taking the time today to share your passion for the Minnesota Vikings with us. And as we close, are there any final thoughts that you'd like to share with Viking fans, especially about our 2013 team? I think our 2013 team is going to do fantastic. Christian Ponder kind of faltered last game. It's his first game of the year. The, the thing that hurt us most last game wasn't really Christian Ponder. What really hurt us was our defensive tackles, not having either Sharif Floyd in there or Kevin Williams. Bush took total advantage of that, uh, and, and he ended up getting uh, so many yards on it, and we, we weren't able to get the pressure. All we could do is get a little bit of pressure from the outside. We got none on the inside. Christian Ponder, uh, that uh, interception before the half, uh, that was – that was totally uncalled for. That that was uh, a turning point in the game. We were we, we were going to go up, you know, by at least eleven points there, and instead we go into the half uh, only up by one. But I think the Vikings are going to do great. You know, get, getting Rose it w was phenomenal, and Patterson. This guy is going to be something else. This guy's going to be another Randy Moss. It's just so sad that we're starting off. With the with, with the lions and the bears on the road, that 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 is such a tough start for us to 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 go in. I, I think the Vikings will still win this division this year, and I still think we got a good shot of uh, being in New York for that Super Bowl this year. Again, Sid, we thank you for joining VikeFans.com, and we really look forward to seeing you in the end zone, both at the Metrodome, but in the end zone at the Super Bowl as well. So, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, school Vikings.